The history of playing cards is still shrouded in a number of mysteries, but we'll try to outline what may be considered the most recent estimation by those who are concerned with them and by the general historians of playing cards in general. The origin of playing cards is unknown. The probabilities are that these cards originated in the Orient. Uh, China makes a pretty strong claim for originality in this particular area. And it is known that they were in use in one way or another among the Chinese for over a thousand years. In Europe, they did not appear until the early years of the 14th century. And in the course of time, many and unbelievable ramifications have set in. The tarot cards probably have a history separate from that of the ordinary gaming or amusement deck. The Court de Gabalon, one of the first great Egyptologists, favored the theory that these uh, major trumps, as they are called, the 22 major cards of the tarot deck, which consisted of 78 cards, that these uh, were actually based upon symbols used in the initiation rites of the ancient Egyptians. Some have held that they may have been carved upon the walls of the inner sanctuaries of the Egyptian mysteries. Others feel that they have, may, may have been freestanding symbols, originally in the form of objects of various shapes, sizes, and proportions, which were used in the instruction of those seeking admission into the sanctuaries. It is also possible as suggested by Pythagorean lore, that these cards were originally used in a sacred oracular manner. The most permanent and enduring aspect of playing cards, except for gaming, has been the connection between them and oracles. The ancient uh, priests of the tabernacle and the temples of Israel had auricular stones set upon the shoulders of their robes by which they were able to determine the will of deity. More, lately, more lately from this, the twelve stones of the breastplate of the high priest were believed to have miraculous powers. In other words, what man was always seeking was some way to dis de discover the will of his deities. He really wanted to know what they wanted him to do. But unfortunately, the heavens were silent, and the only link between deity and the laity was the priesthood. The priests, in turn, composed largely of human beings with no extra spiritual powers or faculties, found it very difficult uh, to make major decisions in the lives of people, either for the course of nations or for the fates of individuals. The priests were always consulted, and in almost every instance, they ultimately fell back upon some type of oracle, some way of invoking deity, some way of bridging the interval between the objective and the spiritual causal universe within which we exist. The development of sacred magic related to these issues, and in many instances, as in the Oracle of Delphi, uh, the discovery of the will of deity came through the priestess who served the oracle, who went into a kind of trance and delivered the mysterious quatrains or hexameter verses by which 
the deities were supposed to answer the questions of mortals. These questions involved many different problems, problems relating to character, to decision, to career, to marriage, to death, and to destiny as far as the major purposes of life were concerned. The philosopher Pythagoras was named for the Pythia of the Temple of Delphi. When the child was born, the Ceres predicted his future and that which he would accomplish, and it was so. We find many references to oracular revelations in the Bible. Usually, however, they were not in the form of cards or anything of that nature, but they were in the form of some type of psychic link between humanity and the powers governing the world. Primitive magic existed in all parts of the earth, among the most savage and primitive peoples. Always in the last analysis, decision was left to fate, and fate in turn was revealed through the oracles. The oracles stood for the concept that there's a destiny that shapes our ends, and the various efforts to determine the nature of this destiny developed over a long period of time. We are inclined to believe that at the very most remote period, Divination was by means of arrows. In other words, uh, small sticks falling in various positions and compositions were held to have sacred meaning. We know that similar sacred meanings were found in China by the use of the so-called oracle bones as early as the second millennium B.C. Oracle bones had inscriptions placed upon the flat bones of animals. These inscriptions were in the form of a question and a built-in type of answer. In the Chinese ideographs, this was comparatively simple. A hot iron was then placed on the reverse side of the bone, causing it to crackle, and the cracklings falling through the inscriptions became the basis of the delineations. We also know that the arrows uh, were perpetuated in China in the form of bamboo tubes with a number of slender rods set in. These rods were shaken out one by one from the tube, and the letter on them was the key to the def definition or delineation. Actually, as we proceed further, we be begin to come upon another type of divination that was very important, and that was with dice. The ancients had several kinds of dice, both in the Orient and in the Occident. And when they excavated the old streets of Jerusalem and got down to the pavement that was there in Bible days, it was discovered that a number of the stones had board-shaped figures cut into them to be used in playing games of dice or in divination. Uh, we know also that according to the t New Testament, th the lots were cast for the robe of Christ. Lots, then, became the basis of ownership. When you could not decide, naturally, to whom a certain article or uh, condition was intended, no one knew what to do about it. They did not know who was always the one to be guilty or the one to be innocent. So lots were cast and the decisions were final. Thus, in a sense, the principle of fate was involved with all of the early uses of divinatory articles. If it is true that the Egyptian temples had within them certain magical figures, also the geometrical solids representing the deities, and systems of numbers by means of which oracles were delivered. We can then remember the Wheel of Pythagoras, which, while it may or may not be authentic, is certainly ancient, and by which 
divination was performed through the combining of letters, particularly the letters of the name of the person asking the question. Always in that period of early study, men turned to the stars uh, for guidance. And uh, the belief of the influence of the planetary bodies upon human life uh, was part of ancient philosophy and still survives under certain persecutions over which it appears to be always victorious. All these little symbols and different articles and different types of things probably led gradually to the production of some type of symbolic card. And one of the earliest names for the tarot cards was the Book of Thoth. Thoth was the Egyptian Hermes. He was the deity that had charge of the books of life. He was the one who spoke for the gods. He was the messenger of the deities. And it was said that he left behind him many books. And it is held by some that the book of Thoth was really the playing cards. Through the constant study and rearrangement of which patterns were created by which human beings could expand their understanding of themselves, their own lives, and the world in which they lived. Actually then, for the uh, origin of cards, we have three or four choices. One Chinese, one Egyptian, one Hindu, and uh, one European. All of these have been explored, but they all fall back finally to the nature of man himself, and that wherever the human being has existed, he has developed some type of divination, some way of consulting the invisible and discovering, if possible, the will of the gods as it applied to the projects and purposes of his own career. In uh, most uh, countries, in practically all of the areas, the original use of cards was sacred. They were intended to be used as means of communicating with the powers of nature. They were not profane. They were not originally used for gaming. They were used to answer the questions that were close to the hearts and souls of human beings. In the years gone by, for example, uh, when the penitenti order was still flourishing in New Mexico, the ceremony annually included the selection of one of the members of the group to play the part of the Christos in the, in the tragedy of Golgotha. In some of the moradas or ch chapels of these orders, the Christos was selected by drawing a card from an old deck. Whoever drew the certain card became the candidate for this role. Now here is a use of it in the 20th century, which is not so different from what it may have been in Egypt, India, or China. It was the fact that no one wanted to select a person. No individual, even if he wished to be selected, was accepted on this grounds alone. There had to be some kind of a sacred uh, omen, a, a sacred symbol to indicate this preference. If, as we now suspect, and rather generally, that divination was the original use, then we begin to understand why and how various designs appeared upon these cards. We know, for example, that they are still used, at least underground, in Tibet, uh, where they contain or are marked with the figures and pictures of the divinities and of the sacred objects of Buddhist uh, Tibetan Buddhism. We have a partial deck in our library that was found inside of an image, inside of a large bronze image. This deck undoubtedly was used entirely for religious purposes. It was not for any intent of amusement. It was in order that the divine laws uh, could be communicated in some pattern or way and instruction bestowed for the improvement of character. Now this may also have been the old Egyptian form. 
in which the cards were used perhaps even so far as to uh, uh, determine those entitled to initiation into the sacred rites. So we could begin with the use of cards as divinational objects exclusively. Then we find that this is true also of most of the streams of omens or symbols that gradually consolidated in the deck of cards. In the Orient, Persian and Hindu cards are entirely uh, used for religious purposes. Uh, later, they gained other fame, but in India, even to the present time, the deck of playing cards is always a religious object. Uh, the most important and most common of these decks is the de uh, deck of ten suits, which contain the cards and symbols of the ten incarnations of Vishnu. Each of the suits is one of the embodiments of the deity. And the uh, pip cards, or the number cards, are ornamented with a device of that particular embodiment. The first embodiment is the fish embodiment, where at the time of his incarnation, Vishnu took upon himself the form of a fish. And at the time of the great deluge, it was this fish that steered the ark with its, in, with its people and its animals to the final resting place of security. The last incarnation of Vishnu has not yet come. It is called the Kalki, or White Horse Avatar. In the deck of cards, it shows Vishnu leading a white horse. Each card has the, uh, each uh, suit card has on it one of the avatars and is accompanied then by a second court card, usually with two horsemen riding in opposite directions. Therefore, unity becomes first manifest as diversity and a dividing or parting of the ways as represented by the Pythagorean letter, which we now call Y. The Indian decks, the Indian decks are very beautiful because most of them are hand done. And even today, they differ in minor uh, appearances and even to a minor degree in the artist's capacity to capture the symbolism. But they are circular. They are painted on discs of heavily prepared paper fiber, which has been lacquered and varnished. And uh, they are divided in color according to the suits. But all of them together represent the great cycle of the embodiment of deity. We have very little record that these cards are used in gaming. Of course, it is possible that this has happened everywhere. But ex except for these cards, we find other cards in India, in, ex in exception to these. One of the other interesting decks is a complete zodiacal deck in which the twelve signs of the zodiac become the suits, and the various court cards are represented as deities, usually enthroned upon the symbol of the zodiac over which they preside. This particular system also seems to have been transferred ultimately to Japan, for there we find uh, in the temples of the esoteric sects uh, booklets and small uh, reliquaries with the deity represented and the, signs, uh, the sign of the zodiac at his feet. Uh, these uh, little relic curios are obtainable. We got several of them in Japan. So the astrological deck was a very interesting one among the Hindus. And uh, it may be noted at this point that complete decks of any of these early cards are virtually unobtainable. Uh, they are in a few world museums because those of artistic quality are usually separated and disposed of separately as miniature paintings. They are very beautifully done. The origin of playing cards in Japan is also rather uncertain. They undoubtedly had indigenous deck types of cards, but when the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Spaniards 
uh, open trade there. European decks were introduced. And from that time on, uh, the Japanese created cards similar to the West but with interesting, curious, and sometimes humorous uh, variations. Uh, wording on these Japanese European cards were, uh, wordings were usually misspelled, less letters misformed, and the attire of the court cards curiously complicated between Eastern and Western costuming. They also, in Japan, had a number of indigenous decks, which we find no equivalent to in any other country. One of these decks that is most interesting is the deck of points, the deck that is used only during the holiday or New Year's season. These, uh, these decks are doubles, one half having a picture of the point and the first lines of a poem. The second and matching card has only the remaining lines of the poem. They are shuffled and in order to select the correct termination to a verse, the players have to be very well versed in literature and in the productions of their various national scholars. In the beginning, these cards were also all hand-painted. They are smaller than our cards and are usually blank on the reverse. These people also had a definite gaming deck consisting of the cards of the flowers and plants ruling the 12 months of the year. Each of these different year cards consisted of a suit of four, showing the various stages in the development of the flower or plant, from the twig to the bud to the blossom to the fruit. These cards are still used very extensively in gaming. The earliest Chinese cards that have come down to us are very much more slender and narrow than our cards and are marked with various black spots apparently arising from dominoes. And it is quite possible that there is a strong connection between Chinese cards and dominoes. And there is also quite a possibility between the Hindu cards and the ancient game of chess. There seems to be no doubt that a number of primitive games were combined by various nations in the production of suitable card symbols. Uh, the game of chess, for example, was played in India by the Mughal emperors, and the chess board was the courtyard of the palace, and each of the, po each of the pieces of the set were played, uh, was played by a living person. Various other variations on these difficult and complicated themes uh, can be picked out and have been traced to the best of ability, but the findings are by no means conclusive at the present time. How the uh, various cards of the Near East, possibly Persia or India, reached Europe is again uncertain. Some believe that they were brought back by the Crusaders whose experiences in the Near East undoubtedly included a study or an acquaintance with the gaming and gambling systems of these countries. Another interesting improvisation lies in the possibility that playing cards were introduced into Europe by the gypsies. Uh, the gypsies themselves are mysterious people, and their name includes the word Egypt, gypsy and it is believed that they may have been uh, remnants of the old Egyptian sacerdotal sects that were driven out by the rise of Christianity. The gypsies became wanderers upon the face of the earth, and they brought with them a, among their treasures, apparently, a number of elements of soothsaying or prediction and prophecy, psychism and clairvoyance. Uh, the uh, gypsies... Uh, had their own cards, but they also used crystals and uh, palmistry and probably a little hint of astrology mixed into it somewhere. The gypsies wandering about Europe uh, became famous as fortune tellers and were presumed to possess what we now call second sight. 
uh, explanations for the second sight also brings in an interesting complication. It is known, of course, that the gypsies became intensely inbred, uh, that they seldom, if ever, married outside of their clan. And in the course of centuries, this inbreeding is believed to have strengthened the psychic pro propensities, that in some mysterious way this inbreeding helped to perpetuate a traditional descent of memory, that the individual was closer to the past, to his own background, and to the environments of his ancestors as the result of having more intimate and continuous contact with the bloodstreams of those who had gone before. Regardless of how we want to view this, certainly the gypsies received a very strong support for their mystic arts. As we come down, down through, we examine certain of the cards, particularly the major trumps of the tarot deck, and these are obtainable now almost anywhere where there is a strong Italian colony. They are still used as gaming cards and for divinational purposes in Italy and in Hungary and in some of the Balkan area. Uh, these cards, these uh, have, however, passed through an interesting modification. As may be realized, the church was dramatically opposed to card playing. It was considered to be uh, a sin not only to gamble, but to use them for divinational purposes. They, uh, the church wasn't entirely successful, but it did accomplish a few restrictions. One of the most common of these was that during the, even the 14th and 15th centuries and 16th centuries, apprentices, being apprenticed to a master, had to sign a contract. And this contract included the line uh, that they were not to play cards at all except on the Sabbath after church. Uh, there appears to have been, however, a little coercion here between the church and uh, business because it was feared, apparently, that those engaged in various useful or necessary applications of energy, various vocations, uh, would be less likely to do a good day's work if they could get off in the corner and play cards. So to protect business, industry, ethics, and the church, the use of cards was heavily restricted. Another interesting detail occurs, and that is that in the tarot deck, the second card is called the papist, or the female pope, and the fifth card is called the pope. Now, there is an old legend that there was once a female pope, which, however, the church is rather reluctant to admit. <laughs> there is also uh, the fact that on these cards, which were constantly criticized and condemned by the church, there were two sacred figures, both relating directly to Christianity, both wearing the papal tiara, both carrying the papal cross. And as time went on, this got to be an aggravation or an aggrievement of one kind or another. So the modern Italian decks have taken out these two cards and put in their place Jupiter and Juno, two uh, Latin deities. But uh, older decks still have the original allotments, and decks prepared in modern times for students of the tarot, of course, have the original form. But the playing deck, as it is used now by the people, no longer contains these two cards, which are considered objectionable. Gaming was gradually introduced, uh, probably as a result of the natural instinct of the human being uh, to hope for quick gain and to remain steadfast under quick loss. Cards or games were originally probably a combination of gaming and the fulfillment of hope. Uh, the individual playing hoped to win. If he won, he considered it a sign of a good destiny. He not only pocketed the money, but had the satisfaction of having gained it through the consent of fate, that it was his by divine right, so to say. 
Uh, the Protestant Reformation practically ended the use of cards uh, in the so-called Protestant areas. But they came back gradually. They were not ousted for long. When the uh, French Revolution overthrew the monarchy, the kings, queens, and jacks of the deck were deprived of their crowns, and all symbols relating to ro royalty were removed from the French decks. They were, however, gradually replaced. Religious decks in the, uh, in the Western world are not uh, too common, but not too rare. Uh, some decks have the court cards as the prophets and apostles and other biblical figures. A very uh, favorite uh, subject for a king card was Charlemagne. And uh, it is said that one of the queens was derived from the symbolism of Hypatia. All kinds of strange and wonderful thoughts have become associated with these cards. Now, the 22 cards of the major deck of the tarot, which is the one most used by students of the subject, are very much cabalized in modern thinking. To the numbers have been added the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And, they have, and the cards have been tied strongly with all of the Hebrew philosophical speculations, including divination. Uh, they have been um, used uh, to reconstruct Kabbalistic designs and have been used as symbols of the various levels and orders of the Kabbalah. In Kabbalism, the great Sopharetic tree uh, appears in four forms, representing the tree of life on four levels of existence. Uh, these four levels of, of the tree of life are represented by the four suits, and the Godhead is, in rep is represented by the court cards. The um, other cards constitute the ten Sephirothic uh, symbols of these ten spheres or worlds, and uh, also come back again to the Pythagorean Tetractus of ten dots. We'll go into that in a few minutes. Actually, then, the old deck of 78 cards was primarily a philosophical deck. As time went on, a number of improvisations were made. The tarot majors or major cards changed their designs. In some cases, characters from classic mythology and from various systems of symbolism were inserted, and later they became involved more or less with uh, contemporary events. Uh, some decks of cards have famous generals, and one of the prime objects of these successful cards in England at one time, uh, the prime object was the Duke of Wellington, who honored uh, himself, or was honored, by being placed among the persons of the deck of playing cards. Also with time, uh, educational cards made their appearance. Uh, cards were used to teach astronomy, mathematics, engineering, medicine. They were used to perpetuate literary and philosophical conclusions. They included the quotations from great poets, and they've covered practically every area of human interest, from the most abstract astronomical and cosmological designs to popular baseball and football players. The cards were used in, in a great many areas gradually secularized until the sacred elements or patterns were practically forgotten. The deck of cards that we use today is based upon English decks, and English decks in turn originated in France. Uh, the cards uh, from the beginning of their introduction into England, uh, probably in the 15th or early 16th century, have not varied greatly in design. They have been more or less consistent in the unfoldment of their symbolism. The uh, older cards have a great charm that are more or less missing from the commercialized decks. The older cards were little works of curiosity in themselves. The various cards had interesting and intriguing designs, and the uh, court cards 
usually represented the various persons full length and uh, in approximate and appropriate garb. One way of dating the cards in England and France has been the costuming of the earliest known decks. By this, it is assumed that they began by contemporary costuming. In uh, the development of our modern deck of cards as we have it today, a number of other interesting situations came into focus. Originally, the three court cards of the deck were the king, the knight, and the page. The three cards continued in this way for some time. And then with the rise of some feministic movement somewhere, the queen was introduced. Now, the queen was introduced by combining the knight and the page and calling it the knave or the jack. So that that card took the place of two cards and the queen was inserted so that it was a deck of king, queen, and jack. Now, maybe more behind this than first meets the eye, inasmuch as the family, the court card family, as represented on the thrones of Europe and throughout the aristocracy, consisted of the father, mother, child. This was the great 47th proposition of Euclid, or rather, more correctly, of Pythagoras, but attributed to Euclid. Therefore, the court cards were transformed into a family. And this family, in, in early religious thinking, uh, became a symbolical of the three persons of the Trinity. So that each of the decks of cards had four suits, and each suit was a trinity. Uh, these, this trinity of the principles or powers of things extended out and was served by the pip or number cards of which there were always ten, being the symbol of the tractus, or the ten spheres in which the divine trinity operates. The trinities in each case belong to one of the levels of human society, so that by the same way they came to be related to the elements, to the uh, quaternaries in the zodiac. They came to be represented by wherever the three stands out as a holy number or as a symbol of equilibrium. The three was the symbol of harmony. It was the symbol of the home, of the family, and of the cooperation of human beings in the furtherance of the divine plan. The deck is, uh, was somewhat abridged by dropping out of the major trumps. The major trumps uh, were no longer included and I think where this change took place, we probably are very close to the time uh, in which gambling or amusement took over and the sacred symbolism gradually faded out. But with the deck of 52 cards, as we have it at the present time, we have some very interesting astronomical factors presenting themselves. And, of course, these cards can be subjected to almost any type of thoughtfulness to find out what they mean. In the first place, we have 12 court cards. These 12 court cards are recognized as, in an astronomical sense, as representing the 12 months of the year. When the double-headed cards were introduced, each of the 12 cards had two portraits on it instead of one, one inverted to the other. These twelve tw uh, d uh, multiplied or increased by a second twelve became twenty-four. These twenty-four faces, therefore, fitted very well into the concept of the twenty-four hours of the day, which in turn descended to us from the twenty-four elders before the throne in the book of Revelation. Having thus uh, more or less identified this particular point, we go on to the consideration of the cards themselves. Each of the suits consists of 13 cards, and the four suits combined give us 52, which is the number of the weeks in the year. If we add the spots on all the cards together, counting the jack as 11, the queen as 12, and the king is 13, then I'm going up from 1 to 13, the result is 364, 
which is one day short of the year. In order to take care of this little detail, at quite an old date, the joker was introduced, which made the number of actual spots 365. Some modern card uh, manufacturers, no doubt without any intention of so doing, now provide their decks with two jokers, whereby we take care of leap year. <laughs> but uh, uh, Milton Pottinger, in one of his studies on symbolism, points out the parallels, for example, between the symbolisms on cards and the symbols of Freemasonry and other ancient esoteric societies. This has, however, certain disadvantages, because if we trace the cards down through the centuries, we find that the many irregularities have stepped in or crept in uh, to change the appearances of the cards. It still remains true, however, that the King of Clubs is probably the grand master of the secret empire of the cards, for he is the only one who, call, who carries the orb, which was the symbol of ultimate royalty. But all the cards can be taken, and you can sit down and compare them. You can also, if you're interested, secure different cards from different makers and compare the details of symbolism. Find that in most instances the major elements of the design are the same. There are differences, some of which may be quite significant. In the older decks, for instance, the orb of the King of Clubs is surmounted by a cross. In the modern decks, the cross has been transformed into a tripolet leaf, which no longer resembles a cross. But if you go back far enough, the cross is restored. So all the new decks and so on are hampered uh, by modernization and by the gradual conventionalizing of the symbols which are upon them. Now, as we go a little further into this rather intriguing subject, we come directly to what seems to be uh, the most important of all considerations, namely the prophetic uh, use of cards. Cards as instruments of divination. And uh, to analyze this could almost confuse the world's greatest thinkers for the simple reason that it has been impossible up to the present time to explain why and how a turn of a shuffled deck of cards can produce a card with a specific meaning for an individual. Yet it would appear that such actually occurs. And if uh, various uh, persons who have been uh, in contact with cartomancy will testify that the cards do have an unca uncanny way of working out, that there is something that happens in connection with the use of them uh, that seems to be still oracular, although they are now used principally in gaming. Of course, even in gaming, the players have to almost pray that the certain cards will appear. <laughs> and if they do not appear, uh, it is almost a sign that the judgment of heaven is against them. Of course, the judgment of heaven is sometimes modified by mock decks and other dishonest practices. Speaking about curiosities in connection with gaming, uh, King James I of England was quite an inveterate gambler. He used to love to go down to Gray's Inn and play with the attorneys down there, his favorite card games. It is even said that many titled ladies enjoyed this for avocational interest. But the king himself was apparently a very busy man, heavily burdened with the responsibilities of state. And when he played cards, he sat and one of his servants sat beside him and played the cards. The king only told him which ones to play. It was too much of a burden to pick the cards out himself. Uh, which uh, also might mean that amateur card players would perhaps be wise to 
have someone beside them who knows how to play for them. And maybe that was part of the king's idea. We do not know. But we do know that one year he lost 100 pounds uh, in playing, but next year he gained back 15 pounds of it. This is recorded as historical. And back to the problem of the moment. The use of the card seems to call to our attention some type of meditational discipline. In other words, uh, the cards form a kind of mandala. It has to be of this type of thing, because various persons, uh, having uh, their fortunes told by cards, have different problems, innumerable, and therefore each card has to have more than one meaning. It has to be a grand over symbol of something in order that the readings could have some type of significance. I think it is the true of this as it is in most systems, that these cards constitute a point of concentration for the person playing or delineating from the deck. This would be true in comparison to many other types of art, the primary purpose of which is to focus attention, to bring the mind to a point, to eliminate outside considerations, to absorb the person in a particular purpose. This might well be true of the gypsies and of other psychics who use cards. The cards are really not the source of the prediction. They are the uh, concentration point by which the card reader makes his own interpretation. If, for example, images can appear in a crystal ball and those involved in this belief feel that such happens and claim that it happens, then a kind of mental imagery can be stimulated by the various cards, each of the cards having a more or less general meaning, is adapted to the life of the person, and then the individual who is interpreting the cards has to pick it up from there and carry it to a completion. Another interesting possibility arising in card uh, reading lies in the interlock interlocking of the magnetic field of the player or the diviner and the subject. The uh, individual may attain a certain contact telepathically. The uh, medium, being a sensitive person, and the card uh, delineator is a psychic without question, the concentration and uh, the proximity can result in a mingling of mental energies or psychic energies. The individual who is being read may have within himself a fairly clear picture of his dilemma, of his situation, or of his need. This can be transferred to the medium, and the medium therefore gains an instinctive, intuitive, general concept of the person for whom he is reading. This, in turn, makes it possible for him to draw upon the subconscious information belonging to the person who asks the question. Take, for example, a simple case. An individual loses a precious object. He goes to a gypsy who reads the cards and tells him where it is. He goes there and finds it. Now, this looks like a nice, tight little miracle and would certainly gain distinction for the delineator. But it is also true that it is quite possible that the individual who has lost the article has forgotten where he put it. But in his subconscious, the record of where he put it is still present and could be, by uh, hypnotic uh, thought, uh, revived. If he put it anywhere, his subconscious nature, his unconscious self, knows where the article is. 
although consciously he does not. In another case, the individual unconscious knows what he should do, but is unable to transmit this to his outer personality. The inner person may also know the danger that lies ahead, but it is not brought into consciousness. A psychic using a meditational device to concentrate energy may very well pick up that which is in locked in the unconscious of the subject, but which is nevertheless actually there. Now, in th matters relating to larger circumstances than this, we have to realize that everything that exists, even minerals and plants, do have a degree of, of the unconscious available to them. With the case of mankind, it is much stronger. But we must realize that a planet has an unconscious, and that it is perfectly possible under certain conditions uh, for a psychic to pick up the records of the processes taking place in the structure and motion of the planetary body. In other words, there is a reason behind everything. Everything is ensouled by life. And everything that is ensouled by life can be read by a person who has this psychic or mediumistic propensity. Now, it does not follow, however, unfortunately, that psychic propensity is stable. It is something over which the possessor has very little actual control. It is not a, inevitable that the person, the, the medium, in a state of meditation or light trance, working with cards, is always going to get the right message. It is quite possible that the message depends to, to a large degree upon the orientation of the psychic. If the psychic's own nature is disturbed, or there are conflicts of interest, or there are situations that cannot be reconciled within the psychic, then the readings may not be correct. And there seems to be no way of telling just how this happens. Also, it may result from the fact that the person consulting has no clear subconscious image of his own intents, or has not formulated a, pro a program, or has not clearly become aware of a situation. Under such conditions, the message may not be uh, correct. By means of symbols, and there are countless kinds of them, a discipline of one-pointedness is certainly brought into focus. It is a discipline in which the person centers his entire attention upon a single point of purpose. Very few of us do this in a normal waking state. We are diversified, we are mixed up in our allegiances and in our acceptances and rejections of circumstances. But in sleep, uh, in dream, the possibility of archetypal dreams is enormous. The individual does contact a deeper surface of his own life, which knows more than he knows about the conditions that affect him. The, one of the reasons why these dream patterns come through is because he is no longer consciously using the mind to advance some attitude or belief of his own, which may be contrary uh, to the general purpose of his life. So as a dream state makes each individual receptive to a deeper part of his own nature, so the meditation state is a state of wakeful dreaming. It is a type of quietude achieved by discipline rather than by natural need for rest. We are all, every moment of the day, in need of some type of psychic rest. We wake up and we are immediately burdened with the problems of the day. And from that time on, we have very little integration in ourselves. 
whatever concentration we do have is direct, directed toward our responsibilities, obligations, duties, or pleasures. Therefore, throughout our waking hours, the internal has very little opportunity to express itself. It is quite the same in the meditative disciplines of the East. You can lay out a deck of cards so that it will be very close to one of the Buddhist or Hindu mandalas. It becomes a thought picture, a kind of orderly structure, the arrangements and rearrangements of which are archetypal. It has something in common with the I Ching, the classic of changes in China, because these readings seemingly obtained by chance by something like the falling of coins or the dropping of whole and broken wooden bars, these things seem completely fortuitous. The I Ching, by the way, came into the West under the name of geomancy, which uses exactly the same principles. But uh, usually the readings are appropriate because the individual having a certain project within himself, interprets into the reading the field of his interest and uh, can almost swear that the original reading was intended for him alone simply because he personalizes it. He makes it his own. He gives it a centeredness uh, that uh, provides what he regards as authentic information. Now, in the use of cards also, we have a great many philosophical concepts. The possibility, for example, of a rule or law governing what we call chance. In the ancient times, there was strong division of opinions concerning the fate or fortune of life. Most of the philosophical people of all times, have believed that life is under law. And only those who have more or less uh, discarded both religion and philosophy are willing to accept that they are the victims of chance or circumstances. This providence that shapes our ends is therefore something that is predestined and foreordained. It is something that must happen. But how does this must happen tie into the idea of the fall of a card out of a deck in which there are other cards, the deck has been shuffled and cut. How are we to say that the one significant and appropriate card comes out of the deck? Some would say that it is the will of God which covers a multitude of uncertainties. Others will believe uh, that there is some kind of a machinery uh, behind the individual which causes these predestined occurrences to arise in various ways. There's hardly anyone lives a life in which they have not at some time received a warning or an omen or a hunch or an intuition that came true. Now this means apparently two things. One, that the individual is in some way related to life in a manner that such curious coincidences are explainable in terms of natural law. We do not know just how to explain them, but that they must be explainable. The second thing that you find in divination is that there are indications, quite obvious and evidence, that these uh, cards predict events that have not yet occurred. In other words, they will tell the outcome of a circumstance that is still uh, uncertain. We know that as individuals we do not have full control over uh, the circumstances that we approach each day. There are possibilities, there are certainties, there are impossibilities, and we must be faced with all of them. Therefore, if there is 
a power somewhere to anticipate future events, even over a period of centuries, to describe in detail occurrences that have not happened. This presents a very elusive but intriguing, intriguing subject. One answer to this has been that there is no change in the life of the person or of the world, which is an immediate change. Change occurs not in the body, but in the psychic content. In other words, an earthquake does not suddenly occur merely uh, through a, a superficial accident. It is not something that just happens. An earthquake is an effect, the cause of which must be equal to the effect which it produces. This is one of the basic hermetic axioms. Now the cause of an earthquake may be moving into its final relationships long before the incident occurs. But if the cause of the earthquake exists subjectively, there may be and is evidence that this subjective cause is sometimes intuitively recognized by a person. That someone tunes in to a process before the process terminates. This seems to be, uh, to a degree, uh, true in the case of card reading. That the individual who is doing the reading is reading for a person in whom the incidents of life are forever in the forming, but do not reach a final state until they express themselves as action. It is quite possible that the psychic field is building up towards something, and that the diviner is able to tune in to this. Very often they may not do tune in in detail, but they receive the general impression of the occurrence which is being built up. A doctor can do the same thing on the physical level. The doctor can tell a patient very largely the state of his symptoms and what they will lead to if they are not corrected. Uh, Ptolemy said there was no fatal necessity in the stars and there probably is no fatal necessity in a deck of cards. But as the doctor, because of acquaintance with the development of, a, of an ailment, can give warning, uh, can perhaps apply remedy, and can certainly diagnose the situation and arrive at a general prognosis of it, so there is within man a power uh, to know the true condition of self, something that is not within the general reach. Some believe that this knowledge of the true condition reposes in the soul, and that therefore the soul is the key to all prediction, all prophecy, all omens. That the psychic self within man is not only the controller of all processes taking place within him, but is also a perpetual diagnostician. It is present in him and is capable of warning. It is capable of pointing out internally through intuition, through hunches, the development and ultimate of a course of action. It also could very well tell him in character analysis the profession he is best fitted for. For the psychic center, the soul, is the manager of both the mind and the emotions. But when the mind and the emotions become too active, too highly specialized, this other, smaller, quieter voice is not heard, and if it is heard, it is rejected or ignored. So the seat of all forewarning probably rests in the individual soul in the world soul, and in the divine soul. In these levels and in these areas, the life of the individual is no longer an uncertainty. Now, in India, it is held also 
that persons coming into birth have a certain power of choice as to the phases of their lives and natures which they will develop in a certain embodiment. The Indian astrologers have done a great deal of work in relating to this subject, but for the most part their findings have been difficult to transfer into Western life. But uh, the principle is that when we come here, we unconsciously know why. We know just about what is happening. And because without the interference of the material mind and the emotions and the inhibitions of the body, the individual is able to listen more directly to the needs of the soul. He may choose a difficult life. He may choose to end a life in tragedy because he knows that in the great pattern of things this is necessary for his own growth. The doctor may therefore warn his patient that he'd better have surgery if he wishes to recover and if he waits too long he won't recover. And the soul inside of man can say you need this discipline. You'd better have it as soon as possible. Otherwise it will recur and the mistakes you are making will multiply <coughs> and your condition will worsen. Realizing these types of things, we can take as, as perhaps a fact <coughs> that inside of us is the supreme fortune teller, that within us is this power that is constantly impelling us to the fulfillment of that destiny which is best for us but which we have a tendency to reject. If therefore in earnestness and in great uh, need we turn to an objective catalyst this can be very important in the solution of a problem. An individual who wouldn't think of going to a maiden aunt for advice will go to a medium. He knows the, the ant too well, or doesn't agree with the ant. Therefore, he goes to someone whom he assumes knows nothing about him. He goes to the fortune teller who lays out the cards. And in laying out the cards, we find the person hoping for an answer to, for a moment at least, suspend his own judgment in the hope that he is going to have a revelation uh, that is more useful. He would never stop uh, uh, alcoholism of his own accord. But if in a deck of cards it appears that if he keeps on drinking he is going to become a hopeless alcoholic, he will listen to that because it seems to come from space. It seems to come from a superior source and he does not realize that this superior source may be inside himself. So when the person relaxes away and says, I'm not going to judge this, I'm going to let the deck of cards tell me, in that very moment he comes the closest to honest judgment of himself. He suspends and refrains for a little while from all the plots and plans that he had made about these circumstances and becoming receptive to something laid out on the table in front of him, he is actually becoming receptive to that which is within him. And having a truer image, the mind will then read that imagery into the card. Of course, there are certain rules relating to card reading. Certain suits and certain cards have distinct uh, letter and meaning. But having a card in a suit with a general meaning, the psychic nature will reveal to him that which in his inner life is in rapport with that meaning. And he will read various things. But he is probably reading primarily from himself. Now this might seem as though it represents a great deceit of some kind, but it really does not. Because actually within each living being 
is the principle of the divine power itself. Therefore, locked within him is a divine wisdom that he doesn't understand. He doesn't know. He's been fighting to gain consciousness of it, but he is only very moderately successful. The power of life within himself is the power of deity, in which rests the pre premonition of all things, the determination of the existence of every living thing rests in the divine. A spark of this divine is in each of us, and if we can get back to it as far as possible and listen to it, we will discover that it has all the answers that a life like ours requires at any given time, inasmuch as these answers are related to the degree of insight and understanding with which we can use them. So each person has his prophet locked within himself. He has within himself the wise principle, which is the wisdom of God in him. He cannot and get away from the pressure of the personality. He must have some kind of a device to assist him in this. Now, these devices have always existed, but we haven't given them very much consideration. We realize that the human mind has to outwit itself in some way before it can penetrate the surface of its own thinking. An Indian down in the Hopi Reservation uh, will take uh, two little pebbles. They're perfectly ordinary stones. Nothing remarkable about them. But if he puts these two stones together and ties them around with a certain number of threads of wool of certain colors, they're not stones anymore. They're fetishes. They represent the capturing of some kind of a mysterious power in the two stones. They are no longer simply stones because he has performed a magic rite over them. And they become God powers or divine powers. Relics of all kinds come under this general heading. The individual, therefore, with the presence of this fetish, gains courage. He becomes more efficient. He may restore debilitated health. He may be successful in having a better harvest. All of these things are attributed to the fetish. But they are actually attributable to the release within himself of bondage to a lesser state of function. In other words, knowing his flock will increase, he tends it appropriately. Knowing that his health will improve, he follows the wisdom of the wet medicine priest and takes care of his health the best he can, following the ancient tribal laws. He becomes obedient to a conviction which he has created by magical means. Now, all kinds of things in nature, whether we realize it or not, have their magical overtones. There is nothing that we can look at, nothing we can touch, that does not have mystery in it. But we are not much concerned with mystery until we are confused. In India, the process of meditation lifts the mind from its commonplace, lifts it from its objectivity, frees it from all so-called external processes, and allows it to rest quietly in the substance of the soul. The soul then has the power to instruct the mind. The mind then interprets this instruction according to its own integrities and its own level of development. And the individual has a thought. He has an idea. He suddenly has a realization. He has a belief that he did not have before. And these various manifestations, conditioned by the mind so that he can accept them, become the basis of changes of all importance in his own life. One of the great changes in human life is repentance. The individual being sorry for what he has done and trying to make amends. The repentance originates in the soul. If in the uh, course of the time he picks a card from a deck 
and he is quiet and wondering and hoping, the concept of repentance begins to move in him. And if the card is favorable, he will try to do what it recommends. If the card is unfavorable, he probably will wait and try again tomorrow because he's determined that he must have the result. But if he is unfortunate, then perhaps he is also going to recognize the negative factor of himself, the guilt factor. The factor that he knows that he has definitely done that which is wrong. And the unfortunate card may prevent him from complicating or compounding the mistakes he has made already. The bad card becomes a warning against something. And in his own soul, he knows what that is. So there are so many different implications and ap applications to divination with cards that the only uh, practical way is to uh, read a, a good handbook on the subject, but always remember that the true decisions arise within yourself. Dependence upon psychic communication is fraught with many dangers, especially when this communication is not solutional to the major values of life. Uh, many psychic revelations are so general uh, or so optimistic that they present no useful contribution. It is only when a proper rapport is established that the individual knows what he needs. We all know what we want, but only the wise know what they need. And in the interpretation of the cards or the crystal or any other form, the superficial part of ourselves wants an answer that will supply us with what we desire. But the deeper part of ourselves is always searching for that which is the greater good, that which will assist us in developing and perfecting our own natures. So if you are given to card reading, if you are given to astrology, if you are given to any of these fields of mysticism, remember always that they are meditation centers by means of which it is hoped that you will explore the deep, deeper part of yourself and find out what your needs really are. A horoscope is a psychological pattern. It is not only something to tell you whether you'll be rich or poor. It is something to point out the chemistry of your own consciousness. And if you are able to relax into the knowledge of yourself, you will constantly receive constructive guidance. But if you relax only into the knowledge of your desires and the fulfillment of your ambitions and appetites, you will get into trouble. But even in cases of this kind, uh, the soul seems to operate more than we realize. The Mademoiselle de Montmartre was the astrologer of Napoleon I. She was his guide for many years, as she was also a palmist and a card reader. She was probably the greatest psychic uh, consultant of her generation. She told Napoleon to stay out of Russia, that the evil card told her that if he went to Russia, all would be lost. But Napoleon thought at that time that he was more important and more powerful than a card. So we went to Russia, and that was the end. Now, the truth of the matter is that in the very depth of himself, in his own psychic nature, Napoleon realized not only the danger of the Russian campaign, because he was an expert militarist, but also he realized that the whole course of his life was essentially wrong. But he concealed this from himself. He concealed his fears from his own mind. He covered his doubts with his arrogance, and he covered his weaknesses with his ambitions. But 
when a person who was able to create a proper rapport with his unconscious read the card, they knew perfectly well that he knew that he shouldn't go to Russia. But he didn't consciously know this. He refused to accept internal guidance. And he also, with Madame Lenormand, refused to accept the guidance of the seeress, who was really telling him the story of himself. So all the way along, if you are interested in the divin divination of any kind, be sure to center this divination thought upon trying to be quiet enough to let the best in you govern the rest. If you can do this, you may receive from the cards some clue and key as to how this best can best be used. But even this will be at least in large measure a secondary substantiation of the primary reading. The reading is that each person must fulfill himself. And in the psychic world where barriers are not as strong as they are here, the flow of psychic energy is susceptible of, of diagnosis. And through the use of it, uh, you can uh, help your life. But you can also help your life by one of the simplest of all of these meditational disciplines, and that is honest prayer, the dedication, devotion to principles, a re realization of right, and the courage to live according to the best you know. These also release the internal. And sometimes this release is a reflection from something outside of yourself. But it's always aimed at that which is within you by means of which, in the fullness of time, you will achieve the purpose for which the soul in you is guiding you. And until then, perhaps you need the dream, you may need the card, you may need the horoscope. But all of these can only help you to release that power in yourself, which is always sufficient to all need, if you use it properly. This is more or less the message of the moment as far as I see it. So thank you very much. <laughs> this is Open House. We hope you'll all visit with us. We're going to have a little talk this afternoon on flowers. And for the occasion, we have placed a whole group of playing cards of different countries along the wall of the library under the glass of the sun, the surface of the cases. So you will see European, Asiatic, Chinese, Persian. And in one book I noticed that in one of the Persian decks of cards, the joker had the portrait of the Shah.